Well, hello and welcome to the Inspired Minds Podcast. My name is Jeff Watson and I am your gracious host. I really sound like the old NPR, current probably NPR shows. Good evening. You're listening to Inspired Minds. Um, what a great week that uh, I've had until I got COVID. So this is the COVID edition, which I currently have. Thank God for vaccines, ladies and gentlemen. Hooray. I am feeling okay-ish, but I got some brain fog. So this intro is going to be cut a little short, and we're going to jump into it because the next one coming up is a brilliant guy named Mark Morey. And Mark Morey is a producer, and he's a writer, and um, done a lot of interesting documentaries. He did one called Building Bombs back in 89. That was about building nuclear weapons and bombs in America in the middle of nowhere. Brilliant and terrifying. Um, did one about Betty Page, the old pinup siren, the bondage queen. Big fan of hers, and that was fun to talk about. Um, and we talked about uh, Orson Welles and the Magnificent Ambersons. This is like, like the dork episode. Not that all of them are, I guess, but this was a super dorky one. But it was fun, too, because we talked about Kent State. He did a documentary about that and that horrifying event uh, back in the 60s. It's a lot funner, I think, than what I'm making it out to be. But uh, I can blame this all on COVID head. And uh, I think that's it. Hopefully, I'll talk to you guys next week or so. Bye. So thank you so much, Mr. Mark Morey, for joining me on the Inspired Minds podcast. Say hello to the gathered throng. Well, hi, Jeff and Gathered Throng. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you know, as as I was mentioning, Mark, a second ago, before we kind of just popped in here, uh, this podcast, it's interesting, actually, this podcast that I'm doing is sort of, e it's evolving kind of more as I've been doing these. I've been doing about 10, I think, at this point. And they all have different strands and different, but the, the DNA is basically the same. And that is, as I mentioned, the kind of the what creativity looks like and and what storytelling looks like right and as i had said um i'm a giant i'm a huge doc nerd massive documentary fan as a kid i can't remember actually the first documentary i saw that really made an impact on me it may have been oh boy i can't oh you know i think it was actually um the one about the two brothers who were elderly and right were, in, in upstate New York, they were like dairy farmers. Exactly. Yes. That was the one. And it really, it, it gave me a sense of what, how a story could be told from, uh, from kind of almost a, an interesting perspective. And, and, you know, those two gentlemen weren't necessarily the subjects of big Hollywood movies, but their story right. was so compelling. Right. So I guess my first question for you really is what was your first taste of documentaries or really the first taste of movies, let's say, that got you inspired? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go to the movies every Saturday. It was Saturday morning. In those days, they had these kids kids programs at Saturday morning at the theaters. Um, that was back in the 50s. And um, I remember an early movie that had a big effect on me. I must have been about nine years old was Vertigo. I mean, Ooh. you know, for a nine-year-old kid, that just blew my <laughs> mind. And then it wasn't yeah. then it wasn't available for like twenty years, you know. So right. So I only got into documentaries later on, both in terms of being a fan of documentaries and making them. Interesting. What were some of the first documentaries that you saw that you remember that kind of lit you up? Well, that's a good question. Oh, you know what? It was during the Vietnam War era. They would circulate these 16, you could go to, it wasn't even in a theater. It was, it was basically, you know, like the Battle of Algiers. I saw yeah. on a six, 16 millimeter print in somebody's living room or something. It was something like that. And, and you know, that was in the days of newsreel. And uh -huh. they were making documentaries about the struggle that was going on in those days. And that, that's how I got into it. It was really sort of political. That's interesting. I never thought about that, but you're right. Like the Battle of Algiers and some of those films, they were they were news pieces essentially, slash perhaps propaganda in some sense, but they were right. documentaries when you really think about it. Right. Well, actually, the Battle of Algiers, I think maybe wasn't a documentary, although it felt like a documentary, but it was part of that 
60s political scene. And I, I don't remember right off the top of my head, but there was many, many 16 millimeter films that were just circulating on this kind of underground circuit. Uh, and if you were politically active in those days, like I was, that's, that's, that's how you knew about them and went to see them. They weren't in theaters. They weren't advertised. It was just, uh, you know, among the, the political activists, the anti-Vietnam War people would gather around these things. I would never heard of that. That is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like if you knew, you knew, and you would go to a friend's house and. Yeah, that yeah exactly. Interesting. Yes, and it was kind. Of, yeah, it would kind of be. Uh, it would kind of. It was reinforcing. I mean, you know, it was unpopular in the in the anti-Vietnam War ways to be against the war. I mean, you were you were you were not a patriot. You were you know the hard hats were against you. The government was against right. you. You had to go into demonstrations and fight the police. So those. Those films kind of opened up to see that, gee, it's just not us battling these kind of things. Interesting. So that begs my next question, I suppose, then. When was it that you think perhaps the documentaries came out of the living room and into the theaters? Well, let's see. Um, I don't know. I remember another film that wasn't a documentary that was documentary-like that I went to a theater saw, The Harder They Come. Jimmy Cliff. Oh, yes. Classic. Yeah. That's and um, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't remember going to a lot of documentaries and theaters. I mean, this was back in the 70s, I guess. And it was only in the 80s that I even started thinking about becoming a filmmaker. What kind of flipped your switch to become a filmmaker? Well, I had been politically active in the 60s and I just looked at you know I was, I was so I, I so disliked what I was seeing on TV especially in the news I thought it was a lot of lies and propaganda and I thought gee I I've never made a film but I can do something better than what I'm seeing on TV that was really my <laughs> initial thought <laughs> <laughs> I can do better <laughs> and 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 you know I I thought of it as a form of political activism you know a way to educate and enlighten people on issues that I thought were important. Right, which is what I would assume. I'm going to go out on a limb here, not much of a limb, and say that 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 animus is what got you doing the Kent State documentary that you helped that you produced, correct? Right. Well, of course. I mean, I mentioned I was active in the anti-Vietnam War movement, and a yeah. Kent State was a you know the, the shootings and killings of four students there, and I think nine other were wounded by the National sure. Guard in, a, in an anti-Vietnam War demonstration after Nixon bombed Cambodia. I mean, that was all seared in our memory. I mean, I remember, I think I was in college then, and 300 universities went on strike in response to the Kent State shootings. And the, 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 the idea that I had an opportunity later on to make a documentary about that, I mean, it just thrilled me to be able to tell that story. I would imagine so. And it, turned, uh, and it turned out well because the film won an Emmy Award. It was the first time that guardsmen who had shot students talked about it on camera. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I mean, I think the Hollywood Reporter review said, makes you feel like you're right there on the bloody scene. So I was happy with how that turned out. That is fantastic. You know, and that reminds me a little bit of um, Alan Lomax. There may be a tie here, at least in my head there is. You tell me if there's or not. But, you know, Alan Lomax would go out and he would do the field recordings, right? Like back in the right. 20s and 30s and such. Right. And he was just interviewing people. But basically what he was doing, he was just had a microphone and said, tell me what's going on, to sing a song or whatever. Right. That seems to me like the first almost like an earlier version of a film documentarian is just doing it in the fields. Right. Yes. Well, that's true. And you reminded me there were some documentaries that were being made that I went back and saw later. The, and I think these were some of the ones we saw in the 60s. You know, there were documentaries made in the 30s about the political struggle that was going on then. So that was, was all, you know, and these were just made by outside of the system, so to speak, just guys who had a camera and, you know, and some film. And it was kind of guerrilla filmmaking. So would you say there was a moment in time, though, when it, Kind of, at least for me personally, I mean, I'm not young, I'm 52, but I kind of remember like Hoop Dreams seemed to be one of the first documentaries yeah. kind of get over the 
over the underground hump, so to speak. Well, Hoop Dreams definitely moved the moves uh, the sort of mainstream view of documentaries that switched with Hoop Dreams. Uh, and of course, my friend Gordon Quinn was involved in that film, and Peter Gilbert, oh. who I worked with, and uh, uh, Steve James, who made that film. So yeah, that was a great. And that, see, that's that's typical of independent documentaries because they took five years to make that. They followed these guys around and followed these right. guys around. That would never be done in the commercial world. That's a great point. <laughs> I didn't I did think about that. You're right. You're like, we got like three minutes or three you know, days to shoot this thing. Find somebody and go. <laughs> right. Well, you know, my first yeah. documentary I spent five years making, principally because I didn't have any money and was trying to raise the money. But that can be an advantage in making documentaries because your story can develop as time passes. And if you're documenting that, that that's one of the storytelling advantages of taking more time. It's funny you bring that up, actually. Um, I'm, I'm kicking around an idea for one myself. And somebody had said the, the same thing to me. They said, because I said, I've got the I've got the general idea of the timeline the narrative. And they said, it's going to change when you actually shoot it, like when you actually work with right. it. Right. And I. Uh, and it hit me because I was so locked into my narrative and kind of am still on this on this idea that I have. But they pointed it out. They said, yeah, it's going to change dramatically. You know, when you're in the editing room, and you're going to see what it looks like and you're just going right. to shoot. And then you're... Is that close to being true? That, yes, that's that's a very important point that maybe a lot of people don't recognize. You know, in a Hollywood film, it's scripted and you shoot it and then the editor is editing to the script. Now, of course, there's a lot of creativity in the editing process, but documentaries are really made in the editing. I mean, whatever you think you're shooting, it may not be what you end up putting together as the best story in the editing room. And of course, another advantage of having some time is you shoot and you edit and you shoot and you edit. I know, you know, we would, I would in that first film I was making, the editor say, well, we could really use a shot of blah, 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 or we, you know, we really need this story element. So we'd go out and shoot it and add to it and add to it. And, you know, it, it turned out well. It's interesting. It's such an interesting inversion of the process for, right. Right. Because like as a musician, if I write a song, the, the song is done essentially. Um, Right. But it's not necessarily the editing of the song that I'm going to find it, or at least the narrative of the song, I suppose. Um, which now actually leads me to another question. And I'm so excited to talk to you because, again, I think docu uh, documentaries are just a, a perfect way to tell a story in many cases. So uh, the way I say this, at least, is that in order to be a good storyteller, you have to do one of two things. One, you have to tell the story in whatever fashion that means right? Poetry, art, song, whatever. But far more importantly, you have to find the story. So my question to you now is, how do you find the story? Because obviously you do. Right. Well, um, you know, you, you, I, I mean, you have, you find a story, but then you have to have more than finding, like in my first film, uh, a, yes, okay. about this nuclear weapons factory in South Carolina. A friend of mine said, you know, there's a demonstration over there. Uh, we should go make a film about it. He started telling me about this. And here's this gigantic nuclear weapons factory just down the road from us, and nobody even knew it was there. Nobody knew about it. I said, okay, well, that, that sounds interesting. That's an interesting subject. I'm against nuclear weapons, right? And mm -hmm. you know, this thing is kind of a big secret. So um, we just went out there and started shooting protesters. And, you know, I, I didn't really even know what the story would be. I just went out there and started shooting with some friends of mine. I talked to some, uh, a friend of mine had just bought a camera and he said, well, if you pay my monthly camera payments, I'll shoot it for you. And, <laughs> um, and, and he recruited some other crew members for me. And just, we just went out there on the idea of, we know we want to make something that's kind of anti-nuclear. And now so I spent a whole summer shooting these protesters. And then at the end of the summer, I realized, well, that isn't really a movie because, you know, everybody's seen anti-nuclear protesters, at least in those days they had, right? Sure. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so then, but then I kind of, when I kind of bore down on it, um, 
I realized there were two guys that we had found at the protest had, that had worked at the bomb factory. One was a physicist who oh. was feeling guilty about having devoted his life to nuclear weapons. Another was an engineer who had been in charge of radioactive waste management at the plant and quit his job in order to try to expose what was going on, sacrifice wow. his career. So, so those, once we started focusing on those two guys and their stories, then that really became the heart of the film. Of course. So we discovered the story. We went out and started shooting and discovered the story and developed it as we were shooting. So then what would you say is your barometer for your antenna to go up? I, I, that's actually, a, that's not the right question. I guess the question is... Well, no, no, really... that, 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 that's not a bad question, actually, because, I mean, a lot of people, you know, will say to me, oh, you know, X, Y, Z, that's a good idea for a documentary. Well, sure. it, and, and I, it, uh, the docu it's a far more involved than just a good idea. I mean, there are plenty of good ideas and good opportunities, but you have to have some kind of inside track or insight or access to some situation. I mean, we actually were able to get inside the bomb plant. Or we just happened to be there at the right time. And we got in there wow. several times to film inside and interview the people that work there and that kind of thing. So you have to, you, you um, I mean, one thing for me, it's, it's, it's like something I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And something like Kent State or the bomb factory, these are political issues that I'm very passionate about. So I had the drive to stick with it for five years, never having made a film to get that film made and finish it. So, you know, it's that, that for me, it's something that I'm passionate about. Right. That it's an animus, I guess, that I, I, I mentioned earlier, that thing is going to ultimately right. drive you through all the madness of making any kind right. of project. On that level. Yes. And that's for anybody that's thinking about making a documentary. That is really an important thing. I think if you're, you know, if you if you're making it on your own and even even if you're trying to raise the money, you've got to have a lot of passion for it because you just got to overcome a lot of obstacles. Uh, what do you like about telling stories? Well, um, you know, like it like in that film Building Bombs, what what made the key to the I, I mean, I, I was a political issue that I was trying to get a hold of and, and and this this they just had this massive dumping of radioactive waste in the water in the river in the environment burying radioactive waste in cardboard boxes and but how do you tell that story how do you make an interesting story out of that right so the the sto we focused on this guy who had actually been in charge of all of that who sacrificed his career and we we focused on his change of character he went from being gung-ho and happy with all of that to trying to do something about it to when they wouldn't let him do anything about it quitting and exposing it and sacrificing himself for it now that's a real character development so you tell the issue through his personal story and people right. can really identify with that character development i would have never thought of that right. actually as it relates to document uh, documentaries right interesting yeah that's interesting. So now I want to, now you'd mentioned about having like an inside line on something. I'm really curious right. about this Betty Page uh, film, this documentary. Well, that's a good example. I mean, I actually was able to get to her when probably in the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years of her life, she only actually had direct contact with about half a dozen people. I mean, she was a recluse. She didn't want to be known. She didn't want to be recognized. She didn't understand why people were interested in her. And um, my entertainment attorney, who was also a very good friend of mine, uh, I was having lunch with him one day, and he was just showing me this pre-publication copy of the book, Betty Page, Life of a Pinup Legend. And this was in 1996. And... Mm -hmm. um, He's just, and I was looking at her, and I, boy, I thought she looked familiar, but boy, she's really fascinating just to even look at. And mm -hmm. uh, there's something about her that just jumps off the page, right? You could recognize that immediately. And then he was telling me, um, well, I'm trying to negotiate this deal with HBO, and they wanted to do a documentary, but now they want to do a feature. But, and I forget exactly what he said. There was a problem with making the deal. They didn't want to pay more money or something, whatever it was. And I said, well, listen, if you don't make the deal with HBO, I want to make 
to deal with her and make a documentary about her without even knowing what the story was or anything. I mean, I was just <laughs> flipping through this book and seeing the pictures. And uh, so he introduced me to her and I made a deal with her and I, I did, you know, she didn't, but she didn't want to go on camera. And I just figured, well, you know, you got to have her on camera. And I, I told her, well, you know, we're going to get a Hollywood, uh, Hollywood uh, makeup person and hair person, and you're going to look great. And she did look good. She was in her 70s, but she still looked like Betty Page. Her hair was turning gray, but she still had the bangs. And I thought wow. she looked great, but I could never convince her to go on camera, which turned out <laughs> to be a good thing. Because uh, what I ended up doing, and this was also suggested by my lawyer, I did a series of inter audio interviews with her just as a kind of research. Just I asked her every question I could think of. It was two or three hour interview. And then a few years later, it was another one. And um, I, I those ended up being the backbone of the film when I had never intended it to be that way. Because she right. narrates the film and I use that audio from those interviews so that she's narrating her own story. Right. To your point that the film wasn't essentially created until you had it in the can. There was, we were very late in the editing process, actually, before I figured out that I could do that. I had seen the kids' phase in the picture, which, which was Robert Evans' audio recordings narrating his life story. That's so right. I realized it could be done, and I realized it was a workable solution. But actually, I had submitted a very early cut uh, to Tom Powers at the Toronto Film Festival, and he said, boy, her voice is great. You know, and he kind of gave me the idea to try to make the film work with just her narration. So I, this is another example of its work. You know, you figure it out in the editing process. So I kind of revamped what I was doing and changed it to see if I could make it work with just my audio recordings of her narrating the whole story. And it's a lot of work to do something like that, making a documentary with no actual narration that you're writing to piece things together. But it worked pretty well. That I mean, you're right. I wouldn't have thought of it that way. That you're right because you are kind of threading it through uh, through the footage that you have. And one thing I find interesting also too, you know, I did a little bit of uh, some more research um, for this, and I, I realized. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, to me it seems like there's an interesting thread between both the Betty Page uh, story with the conservative prurient interests. You know, she's tearing down society. And also the other one that you have done with Blood Ties with the Sally Mann uh, story, where also there was Pat Robertson and this, you know, this very conservative right. Puritan's interest against art. Is, right. And I would assume that's also something that kind of interests you as well, correct? Well, yes. I mean, all of all of the things I'm involved in have some sort of social issue involved in them. That was somewhat less true of the Betty Page film, although I really brought it out with her because she was hauled before a Senate committee for corrupting the morals of American youth. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, there was a censorship of her photographs and, you know, it was considered pornography, if, yeah. you know. So, um, and, and with, the, with the Sally Mann film, now I did not make that film. I discovered that film. Uh, that was actually a film by Stephen Cantor, who was a, in USC grad school. And I saw this film and somebody showed it to me and I went and talked to him and I said, you know, this film is really good. It could be an Academy Award nominee. He says, no, that's just my student film who, you know, that I used to get into graduate school. And I said, well, let me see what I can do with it. I talked him into cutting about 30 seconds out of it so that it would qualify as a short rather than a feature. Because that's <laughs> all we had to do was lose about 30 seconds. So then right. I knew the competition would be would be better. So then I went and got a grant for twenty thousand dollars from a foundation that likes photography, and we ran it around to film festivals, and it got an Academy Award nomination. And of course, I think it's a it's a brilliantly told story. I mean, I, I you know, it, it just it, so you're right. I mean, I was I thought it was good filmmaking, and it had a, an important issue in it. And speaking of films, so this is the big wind up for me. I'm a massive Orson Welles fan. Let's just start there. And right. so when I found out that, yeah, you have, there's this, and I do want you to talk about this, obviously, but about that Magnificent Ambersons uh, trailer, or a trailer, um, Hunt, basically. It, it seemed right. almost like, like a Mission Impossible style 
kind of right. you know like hunt around the world for this for this lost uh, lost print. Um, how did that come about? What, it's just a fascinating story to me. Well, it's my friend Joshua Grossberg is the director of that film. It's his idea. I'm executive producing to try to help him get it made. Uh, and he became fascinated with Orson Welles in film school in the 90s. And uh, he actually went to Brazil right out of film school to really look for the print at that point. And he uncovered some uh, leads and some clues. And uh, so he's, he's kind of been wanting to do this all of this time. And he decided more recently that he wanted to go ahead and see if he could really find the print, make the film, make the film about, you know, this is the Magnificent Ambersons, Orson Welles' second film, his first yeah. film, Citizen Kane, considered by many to be the greatest film ever made. And yeah. Orson Welles himself felt that the Magnificent Ambersons was maybe even better than Citizen Kane. Okay. And, right. but then when, when the, I, I, I guess I want to tell a little of the backstory so people understand Please. who maybe aren't so familiar. Uh, so while they were making Magnificent Ambersons, or at least in the post-production, World War II broke out. This was in 19, early, late 1941, early 1942. So Orson Welles was asked, he was considered the wonderkin, the boy wonder in Hollywood. He had, he had uh, you know, gone to Hollywood after he had done that Mercury Theater thing of the, um, War the, of the, the Martian, War of the World, yeah. where the Martians were invading. That was so successful, it got him this, three picture deal in Hollywood where he had final cut. So, uh, so, so Nelson Rockefeller asked him, Nelson Rockefeller, former governor of New York, big in the Republican party, ran for president, also an owner of the RKO studio where Wells worked. And he asked Wells to go to Brazil as a, to, to try to develop the relationship between the U S and Brazil because, you know, Brazil had this fascist dictator and the United States was afraid he was going to side with Hitler. And uh, so they sent Orson Welles down as to kind of, you know, get, flatter them and get them on our side. And, you know, Orson Welles was a big deal all over the world. And so they were, they were happy to have Orson Welles down there. So he went down to make this other film down there, actually a documentary called It's All True, but he, ha but he hadn't finished editing The Magnificent Amberson. So they, his editor was sending him the materials down in Brazil for him to work on to finish the film. But while he was doing that, the studio decided they did a test screening that didn't go very well, and they decided they needed to, to edit his film. So they, they chopped about 45 minutes out of the version that he had edited and shot a new ending and basically ruined his masterpiece, you could say. And he, he had lost control of it be, partly because he was down in Brazil making this other mm -hmm. film for, on behalf of the United States government as part of the World War II effort. Wow. And so the only existing print of his version was sent down there to Brazil. So this documentary is about going to look for that, the, the, the original director's cut of The Magnificent Amberson. Oh, so just because he was locked out in Brazil working for the government, then they chopped up his film. Right, yes. And, and I tell you, Orson Welles, I mean, if, if, you're, if you like to uh, think about or consider the creative process, Orson Welles is an endlessly fascinating guy in terms of his creativity and and, and what he did, and he's, he's controversial to some people, but one of the things we're hoping to do with this film is to bring a new, younger audience to Orson Welles. God, God bless you. You're, you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, massive. some con th those who are, who are film aficionados consider finding the lost print of the Magnificent Ambers kind of, Amberson's kind of the holy grail of film. I would imagine so. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually the that's actually the vibe I got out of watching the trailer that you guys have up, up up on there was it did feel like that. You know, like I was excited to go down there and find it in the old pastor right. rooms and I would say watch out for a new trailer. I don't know exactly when, but we shot for six weeks or the crew did 
in, in Brazil for six weeks this fall. And we're getting ready to go into post-production on that film. And uh, so I would watch for a new trailer and some news about what's happening with that film. And it is called The Lost Prince. Am I right about that? Yes. Lost Prince. Well, the Lost Prince, is- the, search for, the search for Orson Welles' Magnificent Ambersons. There you go. Well, I got two more questions for you, my good friend. What a wonderful conversation this has been. Uh, let's see if I don't fuck this up for the next two questions. Here we go. Let's see what happens. First of all, who is... Who, do you, who would you say your favorite storyteller is, and whatever that means? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know about my favorite story. I can tell you what some of my favorite films are, and they're not necessarily documentaries. I, I mean, I'm a fan, a fan, fan of old classic films, films like Casablanca. That's I, I mean, I find if I can watch a film over and over and over again and never get tired of it, that's a, that's a good film, right? So Casablanca is one of those. A film that Orson Welles was in, The Third Man, is one of those. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, I, I, and of course Orson Welles is responsible for modern Hollywood, essentially. I mean, he changed the way storytelling was done in films with Citizen Kane. Yeah, absolutely true. Anybody else? Can give me one more name you like. It's got to be somebody. Oh uh, well, Stanley Kubrick. There you go. There you go. I mean, I, another, the, the, the film about uh, the atom bomb, what was the name of that? Uh, oh, Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove. Boy, what a great film that is. Everything that guy did is, well, right. I'm going to go up, only with the exception of that last one he did, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. I went, that's well, that. yeah. <laughs> 2001, was A Space Odyssey was an amazing film. Was it about? I mean, every Paz was a Paz of Glory was fantastic. Um, uh, yeah. um, you know, what was the other one? He, I'm trying to think of the other one he did that was um, well, very. He did an early, earlier. He did, yes, that was. He did an earlier one. Uh, it was a war film. Um, yeah, Paz of Glory. The name of that one. That, that was the one. Right? What? What is it? Paths to, Paths to Glory. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was the man. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been really, really good because now I have one big final Jeopardy question. You ready for this? Okay. As a creative, when do you know you're done? Well, you know, I think uh, you know you're done when you have to cut a scene from the film that you really, really love and you wished it could be in there. But when you cut that one, then you know you're done. Oh, expand on that, please. I love that answer. What does that mean? Well, you know, like when you're 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 editing the documentary, and you you know, it's it's a winnowing process. You know, you've shot hours and hours and hours of stuff, and you cut, have to get it down to ninety minutes. And so you try, you know, different things in different orders, and uh, you know, there's there's things there there, and invariably, I found there's a scene that I really like that just for whatever reason, because it doesn't work in the flow, there's some reason why it doesn't work in the film. It's a great thing, but it just doesn't work. So you have to lose it. And when you lose it, when I've lost that scene, then, then I, you know, you can't cut any more good stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a zero sum at that point. I think that is fantastic. Right. I, I ask that all question right. all the time to people and I get obviously varied answers everywhere, but that's one of my, that is one of my favorites. Um, well, thank you for doing this. I'm, I'm happy to cutting this, unfortunately, a little short because I had COVID. And I, I'm, oh, no, I'm so sorry. I'm all brain foggy right now. So um, oh. I'm vaccinated, so I'm sure I'll be fine. But, you know, just uh, starting, to, starting to kind of almost fall over now. And I don't want to do that. And that would be an odd end to all an right. interview, just plunk. So but well, thank you so I, much I for your time. Okay. Sure, yeah, I'll be fun. I'll be fine. I got PDL late and a bunch of bad Netflix movies. I'm good. <laughs> I'll be fine. All right. But I will send you a, I'll send you a link to all this. And again, thank you so much for your time. And what a wonderful conversation. Sure. I enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you. Great. Take care, sir. All right. Bye-bye. All right.